Good morning, everybody. As you're coming in, I'd like to welcome you to Broadway Baptist Church. Well, I got a little feedback going on. Everybody on stage is up a little earlier on a Sunday morning than we normally are, but we're glad that we can be here and share with you this morning. As our call to worship, I want to read Psalm 100. Daniel, we got feedback in the monitors up here. Thank you. Psalm 100 says, Shout shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. You stand with us. We're going to start off with a couple of hymns. They're going to be spiced up a little. So if you want to move around uh, there, that'd be great. Sing along with us. Of 
Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned on me, with singing how marvelous.
Stand up, greet your neighbor this morning, ask everybody how it's, how it's going. How about you share, as you're greeting each other, what your favorite vacation destination is. So share your favorite vacation destination with your neighbor. prayer. You may be seated. Welcome to Broadway Baptist Church. I'm going to give our welcome and say our offertory prayer. So, uh, it might, does it sound odd? Do it, is my microphone off a little bit? If y'all don't mind up there turning me down some. So, we are glad you're here at our church. And I hope you received a bulletin. I see some guests here with us. You just fill our connection card. And in a few minutes, we're going to have our offering. And we'll drop your connection card in your offering plate. So, we you can see in the bulletin some of the events up on the screen. Some of the events as well going on here at our church. I want to share some sad news. Uh, yesterday I got a phone call. It was about, uh, about 6.30, 6.45. Many of you know John Smith. John, he attended this service. His wife is Rhoda. They're in Todd Odd Sunday School class, and they would sit over here in this section. He unexpectedly passed away yesterday afternoon. His son is Darren Smith. You all know Susan Smith in the choir. Uh, Darren called me about 6.30 yesterday and said, Pastor, my, my dad passed away just a couple hours ago, so... Uh, it was unexpected. Uh, many of you know John. Um, just wonderful, godly folks. Been married 68 years to Rhoda. They were actually, in about a week, they were going to move over to Cedarhurst over here. They were scheduled. They, um, they live off Man of War and I think Pine Needles Lane, that community over there. And they were going to move into Cedarhurst. And, and then this happened. So I, I went over there and they're, they're planning the funeral service here at the church this week. So... I'll be in touch with y'all about when that is. They're going to Kerr Brothers this afternoon to meet with the funeral home. But that is just, uh, it was sudden and tragic uh, because it had happened so fast. Darren told me he, he, call, he kept calling his dad and his dad wouldn't answer the phone. And so he said, something's not right. So he, he went over there and found him. It was just, just tragic. And his mother was in a state of shock. So it was um, sad. So uh, be praying for the Smith family, for Darren. They have five sons. Two of them live here in uh, Lexington, and then three of them, most of them live in Florida, where everybody else lives. We were talking about our favorite vacation spots, so that's where the world is right now. So that's where it's, it's a lot of their boys live down there. But and then certainly be praying for Rhoda. Her health's not the best, and she just lost her husband. So I did want to share that update with you on the Smith family uh, with that sudden passing of that. Well, we are glad you are here at Broadway, an exciting time of worship. I'm going to be preaching on the burning bush. This is our 1115 Contemporary um, uh, Praise Band right here. They're leading our worship. David is in Cancun with our senior adults right now. They're on a, a winter trip. That's where they're at. 
So at this time, I'm going to actually say our offertory prayer. I'm going to invite the men. If you're passing the offering plate, why don't you go ahead at this time and walk forward to the offering. That way we have our eight men up front. I'm going to lead us in our prayer, and then we'll pass our offering plate. So why don't we bow our heads and pray. God, we do pray right now for the Smith family. I pray for Miss Rhoda. Lord, it's just so sudden. Yesterday afternoon, her, her husband just is now in your presence. Lord, I pray for Darren. He lost his dad. Uh, just a wonderful, godly man. I pray for Susan. She lost her, her father-in-law. I just pray for her. I pray for their five sons. That they are just, uh, all of a sudden, they're probably getting ready for something else. And now they're planning a funeral service. It just uh, changes everything. I pray for uh, just your wisdom and guidance. And how it reminds us that we spiritually, and we as a family, we, in our context of our family, we never know when our time is going to come when you call us home. Lord, we thank you that John was saved and he is now in heaven with you. Even though we miss him, obviously, here on earth, that he, through your, what you did on the cross, through the resurrection, he is in your presence. Lord, this offering as we give, Lord, giving is an act of worship. Lord, we pray, we give, as the Bible tells us, the book of 1 Corinthians, with a cheerful heart. That, Lord, we won't uh, begrudgingly ever give. We will have a spirit of thankfulness, mostly all thankful that we are saved. Lord, we thank you for this offering. We will give it back to you. And, Lord, we just pray as we go through this service, our entire focus is on you. Worship, as the songs say, you, you, are, you are a holy God, and we come to you in a holy, reverent way. In Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen. Pass off from one. Here we go.
God, we thank you so much that you give us the chance to to believe in you, uh, to call upon your name, to confess our sins that way that uh, we can come to heaven and sing in that chorus of a thousand hallelujahs. We thank you so much uh, for this church, for this congregation. I pray that we are all engaged and we are all uh, 
we are all willing to answer the call to go out and spread your word to all the people that we uh, encounter in our work or our friends or uh, just at the grocery store or wherever we may be, just always remembering to share your love and your word with those around us. We pray for our pastor this morning, pray that he is anointed, and I pray that his message uh, just resounds in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Beecher. Thank you so much, Ben, for that. Thank you for praying for our message here. I just I want to give you some more sad news. Uh, Danette Land just came up to me a second ago. Many of you know Sheila Walford. Sheila used to actually run our nursery here for decades, and she has been battling cancer. I did not know this. She passed away yesterday. So if you remember Sheila, she uh, married later in life to a gentleman named Wally, and her mother was Bernice Wofford, who passed away during COVID. So uh, she lived here and been in our church for decades and has been sick. But that um, I just found out that a few seconds, a few minutes ago. But that is Sheila Wofford uh, passed away as well. So I wanted to give you all an update for that. And I will, when I, when I find out arrangements on that uh, memorial service, I'll be in touch with you as well about that. All right, Miss Haley Lyons, will you stand up? We have Parents Children's Church. If you are a child and you want to go to children's church at this time, you will stand up and you're going to follow Miss Haley over here downstairs to children's church. And right when children's church is over, you will go straight into Sunday school. So all the children at this time are going to children's church. For those of us upstairs in big church, we want to open up our Bibles to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 through Exodus chapter 3, verse 10. This is a passage here on the burning bush. Then in a little bit, and I want you to reference this because later on we're going to turn to it. We're going to turn because Jesus spoke about the burning bush. And if Jesus spoke about it, we need to know what, he's, what this story is about. So in a little bit, we're going to turn our Bibles to Mark chapter 12, verses 26 and 27. So you're in your Bible, Exodus 2, 23, Mark 12, 26. Those are our passages today. This is a message here that is going to wrap up a sermon series for this entire month on prayer. And you think, what does a burning bush have to do with prayer? It has everything to do with prayer because this is how the Lord spoke to Moses. And we in our own personal life, we have to be able to say, is a bush burning? Is a voice speaking? And that's a question regularly, if not all the time, we have to be asking ourselves, are we seeing, are we uh, hearing a, from a bush? Because this story here is about to transform the trajectory of the Bible. Now, this wraps up our sermon series here on, uh, on prayer. Beginning next week, I'm starting a sermon series. Now, it will be interrupted in March because of the now weekend. But it's going to be a sermon series that's going to be very unique. It's called In Between. And what it's about, the Israelites, and this story actually uh, projects straight into it. And, and because many ways our lives are like the, this. When the Israelites, remember, they were in slavery for 400 years. They Remember, they went down into Egypt. Joseph led them down there. And there was 100 and, about 175 of them, a very small group. It was, all, it was uh, Jacob, he was an elderly man, he brought his family, and they went down there because Joseph, he was a saver, and I'm preaching on saving this Sunday, uh, Sunday night tonight, he was saved his money, he uh, just, or he didn't save his money, he saved grain back then, that was their money, they saved up grain, and then when s seven good years of saving, then came along seven bad years, a famine, they, Egypt was prepared, so the entire world had to come to Egypt and get food. So what happened was in Israel, Jacob and all his family, one of the patriarchs, he ran out of food. So they had to all bring all their family to live. You have to go where the food is. You have to stay alive. You have to go to Egypt sometimes. And they went to Egypt to get their grain. And they were there, and uh, a year or two, turned into 400 years. Have you ever stayed somewhere that you had no clue, you had no purpose? Maybe you live here in Lexington and you came here in your early 20s for a job and here you are 60 or 70 years old and you were just planning on being here two or three years and next thing you know, 50 years later, you're still stuck here. I mean, these types of things happen. 
You don't plan on your life being in one city. You want to go back home. But you didn't end up going back home. You got stuck in Egypt. I see some of you shaking your head. So you know what I'm talking about. It's like, I'm not, I'm not from this area. I didn't want to be here, but here I am. So that is just where God has you. Well, at that time, after 400 years, something happened. There's a man named Moses. Moses is one of the most unique people in the Bible. He, Moses, his life is broken down into three segments. His first segment here is when he was in wealth. He was raised in Egypt under Pharaoh in the palace. And then when he was 40 years old, he killed a man. He lost his temper. Have you ever lost your temper and you said something and you did something? Maybe you didn't quite kill the person. You might have felt like you wanted to. You might have came close, but they didn't die. And uh, you did something and you just regretted that. Moses had, when he was 40 years old, he had one of those experiences. And then for the next 40 years, he had to go and be a fugitive. A fugitive is someone who's running away. People found out he murdered someone. So from years 40 to 80, he went to an area. Actually, I want to show you. I have a map of it up here up on the screen. It's called Midian. And Midian, if you look at this, this is, this is uh, you see where Negev is right there? That's getting up into Israel. See where it says Midian over there? That's actually current day Saudi Arabia. See that Sinai Peninsula? Current day, that is Egypt. Well, if you look on the left of the Sinai Peninsula, that's the main part of Egypt. That's where Moses and all the Israelites were. That's where he killed a man. He fled over from the Sinai Peninsula because Egypt maintained that area. They still do today. He had to get all the way over to Midian. And Midian was the desert. Midian's in Saudi Arabia. Midian, there's just nothing. It's just it's sand. It's just barrenness. It's the wilderness. People don't live in it. Nobody wants to go over there. So if you're, if you're a fugitive... If you want to get away from someone, you go to the middle of nowhere. You go to Midian. And that's what he did. He traveled over there. So what happened for 40 years, from year age 40 to age 80, he was in this area called Midian. Say, so what did he do in Midian? Well, he met a wife. And her name was Zipporah. And they had one son named Gershom. That's how they named their children. And then he worked as a shepherd. Now understand, this man was raised, Moses, in the palace. He was raised in, under Pharaoh. He had all the wealth in the world. Egypt was the most powerful nation on earth at this time. And because of his loss of his anger and his temper and killing someone, he's now a fugitive in the middle of nowhere. So I bet for 40 years this man... He probably thought, you know, I had it all in my early days, but one mistake, one time of losing my temper, one time of hitting someone a little too hard and they died, and I murdered them, and then he buried them in the sand, and they got, somebody saw them. And they were, they, you know, once somebody sees you, you know, it's over. You know, the word gets out. So Moses realized, I need to get out of town because he was going to be executed. That's that, how they did business. Right? You kill someone, they kill you. So... Uh, if it was still that way today, crime would go way down here in America. Uh, but anyway, that's what happened. So Moses had to flee. And you think about Moses at this time, from years 40 to years 80. He's probably, he, you know, he's working for his father-in-law. Now his wife was probably a little bit younger, so his father-in-law might be the same age as him. And not only that, Moses too, he is a shepherd. He's watching sheep. I mean, that was not a noble job from where he used to live. So, like, he's thinking, I'm in retirement years. This, my days are over. My, my prime, I'm well past that. I see the sunset on the horizon. I'm no longer in Egypt. I'm in this foreign, desolate land called Midian. And then at 80 years old, something happens. And... The, I'm going back to the sermon series, starting next week, we're going to talk about, I'm going to show you what we call the in-between time for Israel. Because at 80 years old, God called him through this burning bush we're about to read. And he's got a big plan for Moses. And many of us, when you're 80 years old, you feel like it's over. I mean, think about it. Who do we know who's 80 years old? 
President Joe Biden is 81 years old. Could you imagine? What if President Biden, 81 years old, God all of a sudden calls him through a burning bush. He's got great plans and wonderful things are going to happen. Many people already think he's a little too old to be our president. But God's saying, no, you're just getting started, President Biden. You're now 80, so it's time to rev it up. So that's what's going to happen in Moses' life when so many people probably think my days are over. But from the years of 80 to 120, Moses lived, the Bible says he was actually still had a lot of vigor at 120 years old. He lived a long time. That's why you hear people make that statement. With, He's old as Moses. I mean, Moses, every, 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 his life really didn't start till he was 80. I mean, his prime, he was from 80 to 120 was when this man experienced most of his things in life. And that was when the Lord spoke to him the most. And that in-between time for him is after slavery. Because Moses led the people out of slavery through the Red Sea. But then, before the Promised Land. That 40-year period, you're, you're, you're no longer in spiritual bondage over here. But you haven't gotten to the Promised Land. You're not in heaven. So you're just like in this transitional state. And some of you feel that way. You know what your past used to be like, but you have not arrived yet to your future. So you're in this in-between, and that's what we're going to be looking at really for the next six, six Sundays here. So you're in your Bible, Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. Here we go. After a long time, the king of Egypt, the king of Egypt is Pharaoh. The Israelites groaned because of their difficult labor. They cried out and their cry for help because of the difficult labor ascended to God. The king of Egypt, things changed in Egypt. They're talking about going back to the days of Moses. The days of Moses. He's born, or days of Joseph. That king was very kind. The Pharaoh's king to uh, uh, Joseph. But, you know, when you have different Pharaohs, they change. Just because one was kind doesn't mean the next one's going to be kind. Then after 400 years, they forgot who's Joseph. Now we've got slavery going on. So that, that's what has occurred right here. So the world is changing in Egypt. The Pharaoh that was nice is long gone. The Pharaoh that's mean is running the show. And all of a sudden, the Israelites finding themselves in bondage. Things change in our life. Someone who's nice, good times back yesteryear is not like that today. Things are different. These people are crying out to God. This is why you need a prayer life. We do not know what our future holds. We, st- we, we, we cry out and call to God during the good times and during the bad times. During seasons of, of wonderful harvest and then times of just famine. Difficult, dark days. That's what we see right here. They are in a dark period. They're in slavery. Verse 24, God heard their groaning. And look at this. This is what the Lord does. The Lord does not forget you. He does not forget you. You might feel like I am in the wilderness. I am in Midian. I am being lost and forgotten for the Lord. But He does not forget us. God heard their groaning, and God remembered His covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the Israelites, and look at this, and God knew. What did God know? God knew His covenant. He knew His promise. He knew the pain they were going through. God knew that my people are stuck in Egypt, and they are making bricks. They are doing farming. They are getting beat. They are getting whipped. It is difficult labor for them. It is not the glory days of Joseph anymore. Times have changed. And they are struggling, and they are crying out to God, asking Him, Lord, this is awful. We are just in bondage and slavery here. And now we see, now understand what's happened at this point. Moses is gone. He has fled. He witnessed all of this slavery, but he had left. He has been in Midian, so it got worse after he left, but he was aware of what was going on. And he's probably thinking, my days are over. So now we're going to pick up in chapter 3, verse 1. This is, the Lord is setting up for something to happen. His redemptive plan. And this is what happens in mine and your life when we get saved. We have a burning bush experience. There's a bush 
burning, and it catches us off guard. But look here about Moses. As we go through this, I'm going to stop and explain it and apply this in our life because we want to ask a question this morning. God, are you trying to get my attention? Is a bush burning that is very unexpected? Verse, chapter 3, verse 1. Meanwhile, Moses was shepherding the flock for his father-in-law, Jethro. Would, men, would you want to work for your father-in-law? Would you want to, I mean, this guy is working for a man named Jethro. The only type of, does anybody even know anyone here named, anybody know anybody named Jethro? That is something like on the, I think the Beverly Hillbillies had a man named, that, when we, Sherry and I go back to Alabama, we meet people named Jethro. You just don't see people who named Jethro. So Moses' employer is named Jethro. So Jethro is his father-in-law. So this is not probably the best situation to work for. You can just see, I mean, I'm 80 years old, I work for Jethro, I'm watching sheep, and I'm a fugitive. It's just his, not his ideal scenario. And, his, and not only that, his dad Jethro was a priest. That means that was a preacher, but he wasn't a preacher of the gospel, so he probably worshipped foreign gods. Or he did worship foreign gods, because he even worshipped the Lord. So he, he's, a, he's working for a, a, a preacher who's, who's not a biblical preacher, he's a priest in Midian. Now look at this. This is when God gets a hold of us. When we least expect it. It says, it says here, He led the flock, remember he's a shepherd, to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. I want to tell you, sound team, can you all put back up the map? I want to show you where Moses went. See what happened, remember, when you're a shepherd and you've got all these sheep and you live in Saudi Arabia and there's not a lot of grass and you just you know, and animals can't live on sand. You have to go where the, the food is. So you see that little uh, sign, Jabel, uh, over in Midian, Jabel something. It's an Arabic word. That's probably about mo where Moses was a fugitive to. But he led, he probably was, he went several weeks. He would take, the, uh, they've got to eat the sheep. So they went around that little, um, that's a gulf of something, it starts with an A, he went around that little area, and you can see down in Sinai Peninsula where it says traditional Mount Sinai. That is where he, so he's probably several weeks. He's just going to the far side. So he actually went into Egypt. But remember, it had been 40 years, and this is the middle of nowhere. So he's thinking, I'm just going to go in there, find some grass, and go back home. Let the little sheep eat. So he's out of position. What I mean by that, he's a long way from home. He He's in an area that he probably doesn't normally go to. He's doing, he's just doing this, meandering around. He probably has three, four thousand sheep with him. And they're just, they're eating. I mean, this is just a blah job. You're watch, you're moving sheep along wherever the grass is. And the grass happened to be all the way back into the Sinai area. It's still in the desert, but there was some, there was some green grass over there. So understand, he's, all, he's a long way from where he normally is. It says he's on the far side. I tell you, when you're on the far side, when you're far away like this, when you're out of position, when you're away from home, that's a dangerous place to be because that's when the burning bush shows up. When he least expected. When he wasn't looking for it. Probably a lot of us, you come to church, you expect to see a burning bush maybe right here. But sometimes the burning bush isn't right here. It might be at work. It might be when you travel somewhere. It might be when you're, you're on vacation. It's just when you're out of your normal habits and your routine and God uses someone, something very unlikely to speak to you. And that's what's about to happen. And it happens in our life. Look here. Look how the Lord gets His attention. The Lord sends an angel then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. As Moses looked, so Moses is standing here, and a bush is on fire in the middle of the desert. So my goodness. But the bush doesn't burn up. It's like a Duraflame log that never goes out. I can't use those anymore because they're not good for your fireplace, I was told. But you're just, it's burning and burning and burning because that is the greatest fire I've ever seen. The bush never dies. And it, it gets his attention. 
This is how God gets us. Something unusual is happening. I don't normally see that. This bush is on fire. See, God uses just everyday things in our life. Moses has probably seen a billion bushes because he's a shepherd and this is all he does. But this one bush is different. And this one bush came about in an unusual place that he doesn't normally go. So he's looking and says, as Moses looked, he saw the bush was on fire, but it's not consumed. So the Lord is getting his attention. I'm going to tell you this, how is the Lord getting your attention? What is he using in your life? It's going to be something unusual. It could be something actually very uh, ordinary, but it's presented now all of a sudden in an unusual way, because that's what's happening here. So Moses thought, verse 3, I must go over and look at this remarkable sight. I mean, here you are by yourself in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing else to do, and the bush never will burn up. So he's going, I'm going to go take a look at this. I've never in my life seen this type of sight. Why isn't the bush burning up? Like, this doesn't go with science. This should not happen. Now, when you, now think about it. What if Moses would have just thought, well, I guess just here we are in Sinai Peninsula. The bushes are a little different. They just don't, they, the fires just keep burning forever. And he just would have kept on going. But he didn't. He stopped and he went over. Sometimes in our life, when God's trying to get our attention, we have to say, I need to go take a closer look, Lord. What, what are you, what's going on here? Now, watch what's about to happen. God realized, okay, I was fishing for you, Moses. I got you. You're, you're headed towards me. I'm really, he, God's reeling him in here. He's going fishing. He's bringing Moses in. He said, Moses, come a little closer. Don't worry about the sheep. I'm going to draw you into this bush. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called out from him in the bush. The bush is now. The voice is speaking. The bush talks. Lord, or he says, Moses, Moses. The, the bush knows his name. The bush is speaking to Moses. Here I am, he answered. You know, that is how we respond to the Lord. Here I am. I'm right here. Not going anywhere. I'm talking to a bush. And look what God says here. He, he introduces, he gets Moses' attention. And Moses says, I'm right here. And for us, you need to say, Lord, where am I at? I'm here. Maybe I don't, don't need to be here. I'm on the far side of a mountain. I'm out of position. I'm doing and talking to people and doing things I shouldn't be doing. But here I am. And look what God says here. Now this isn't... Now, Remember, Moses, he has not had an experience with the Lord like this yet. Remember who Moses was. His parents, uh, they put him in, a, in a, a basket and sent him down the Nile River. And Pharaoh's uh, daughter found him and he was pulled out of the basket. And that's where the name Moses goes. He was drew out of the water. So that's how he ended up being raised in Pharaoh's home. He should have been killed as a little baby. Because the number of ba uh, Hebrew ba baby boys were just multiplying. And, and the Pharaoh wanted them all killed. But here we see Moses was saved. He was spared from that, from that massacre. But he never had an experience like this with the Lord. He just grew up in Pharaoh's house. He spent 40 years working for Jethro as a shepherd. And now this is the first time the Lord has spoken to Moses. Made a very clear revelation. So he doesn't know who's talking. To He's talking to a bush. And look what he says. The first thing God says to Moses. He doesn't even say his name. He says, do not come any closer. Like, stop. Don't keep walking up to the bush. You've come close enough to the bush. Remove the sandals from your feet. For the place you are standing is holy ground. Two commands to Moses. First of all, don't come any closer to this, this bush. This bush is now a holy bush. This is the Lord talking through this bush. This bush is different than any other bush that's ever existed. And number two, Moses, I need you to take those shoes off. Now think about it. If you're in the Sinai Peninsula and you were told to take off your shoes, I bet the sand is really hot. 
because it, we all know when we go to Florida and you, it's the middle, middle of the day and you, take, you don't have flip-flops and sandals on, your feet start to burn. So unless Moses, has, Moses had really callous feet, uh, he's now standing on the sand, sandals off, and he can't walk any closer to the bush. Why? Why did this happen? Because here's why. You are now on holy ground. You're in the presence of God. One of the first things God does when He gets a hold of us and He speaks to us through a burning bush, He has to remind us of His holiness. This is a holy place here, the sanctuary. We are a holy people set apart for God. Moses is being reminded of God's holiness. God is not like Moses. He's not a man. He's not sinful. He is different. And Moses is now has entered into a relationship here talking to the Lord. So your sandals are going to come off. So that is the first thing that had to happen. So the first thing that happens when God speaks to you and I, He's going to remind us that He's the Lord. He's God. And we don't address Him in a casual way. This is not just happenstance what we're seeing here. You have to maintain this uh, distance. Now look here. Verse uh, uh, verse 6. Now God is going to introduce himself. So God's going to continue speaking. He first had to make sure Moses took off his shoes. Have you ever gone over to somebody's house? First thing they said, you need to take, you know, they start letting you know, and the kind of way they do is say, oh, you can put your shoes right over here. They don't ask you to take off your shoes. They just let you know, you can put your shoes over here. We are not allowed to wear shoes in our house. Because if you wear shoes at your house, you have to vacuum and sweep more often. But if you take them off the door, you don't have to do that. I speak from personal experience. So that, that is a fact. If you, so you take your shoes off for your house, you don't have to run that vacuum cleaner every other day. <clears throat> so here we are taking our sandals off. And the first thing God does is he's letting him know who he is. Now, what he says, this is the verse that Jesus is going to quote. We're about to turn to. Jesus quotes this about all the Bible verses about the burning bush. He doesn't talk about the burning bush. He's talking about the name of God. Because the name of God means not this God of the past. He's, the, he's God of the present. Look here, verse 6. Then God continued in verse 6. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses' response, look at this. He hid his face from the Lord because he was afraid to look at God. Moses is realizing, oh my, the Lord is speaking to me. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He begins to then hide his face from the Lord, from this burning bush. You know what's powerful about this passage? Just a few months later in Exodus chapter 33, that's in 30 chapters from now, Moses is meeting face to face with God. That's what a transformation does to you. And one day you're hiding your face from God. You're scared to death. By chapter 33, Moses is ready. I preached on this not too long ago, if you remember. He says, Lord, I want to see you. I want to know you more. That's what God does to us spiritually. We go from being afraid of God to saying, Lord, no, I desire more. Lord, I want your face. I want you. That's, that's what happens when we begin to grow and know the Lord. Now, I want you to keep your finger here in Exodus because we have to flip over now at this point to the book of Mark because Jesus spoke about this. He actually interprets this Bible verse. Flip over. The whole burning bush experience, this was the verse our Lord spoke about. You Hold your finger there in Exodus chapter 3. Look over in Mark chapter 12. Look at verse 26. Jesus got this question about, this goofy question about marriage. In the Bible, if you were a female and you married somebody, and then he died. You were then, you had the option, you could marry his brother. So the Sadducees, who did not believe in the resurrection, says, what if this one lady marries a man, and he had six other brothers, and they just kept dying? I mean, they would marry one brother, the brother would die. She'd marry the next guy, and the next guy would die. And she married all seven of the brothers, and they all died. Then at the resurrection in heaven, Whose husband would she be? So, and Jesus said, that is a silly question. Like, that is not the, the, the point of marrying your brother. That was to provide for widow care with that. But look what happens here. Jesus now is going to interpret the burning bush experience here. 
Verse 26, Mark 12, 26. For as for the dead being raised, because this is actually about the resurrection, the burning bush. Haven't you read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, Jesus said, that's what we just read. How God said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. That was Exodus 3, 6, we just read. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are badly mistaking meaning. What Jesus is saying here, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you don't realize this, but they're actually still alive. They're alive in heaven. You're speaking about them in past tense. But he didn't say, I was the God of Abraham. He says, I am the God of Abraham. Meaning God is still with Abraham. Abraham is with the Lord in heaven. That relationship didn't end at death. God is still their God. Even today, God is still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and and Jacob. And our two uh, church members who passed away yesterday, John Smith and Sheila Wofford, He is still their God, even though they are not with us. They are in heaven with the Lord right now, and He is still their God. That's what happens at death. That's because of the resurrection. That's because death does not end. Death kills our body, our flesh. It does not kill us spiritually. It kills us physically. That's what Jesus is saying. saying, Sadducees, you do not understand this. You're, this is silliness what you're talking about. God is still their God. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive. They're not gone. Now flip back in your Bible. Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. Moses is hiding his face. God had just, first thing he did by revealing his name, he had to tell Moses who he was and that he is still currently the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Just like he is still our God. Now look what happens here. Here is the mission. And Moses, we're not going to get into his excuses, but Moses responded, what God is about to tell Moses actually is going to continue the next 40 years. Now, they, they, they don't obey. Moses gives some uh, flimsy excuses. But the plan that God said never changed right here. Verse 7, then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt. And I've heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I know about their suffering, and I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from the land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the territory of the Canaanites, Hethites, Amorites, Prezerites, Hivites, and Jebusites. All these peoples were living in Canaan at this time. So because of the Israelites, cry for help has come to me, and I also have seen the way of the Egyptians, how they're oppressing them, Therefore, go. That's his command. He says, I've seen this oppression, and I'm going to deliver them and bring these people in bondage. So God's saying, here's your plan. You're going to be delivered from slavery. This is a picture of our salvation. You're no longer going to be in slavery. Now remember, a bush, a bush is giving us the next 40 years in the Bible here. A a burning bush is telling us the master plan for Moses' life. Moses doesn't accept it. But it never actually comes true. Everything this bush says, is just, it just gets repeated the next 40 years. He says, therefore go, I am sending you to Pharaoh, so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. They're leaving slavery, and they're going to go to the promised land. And Moses, it's time for you, as the bush talks to you, go ahead, just let the sheep do whatever they need to go, and just go ahead and just head on up to to Cairo, Egypt. It's time to go see Pharaoh's palace. Let's go have a talk with Pharaoh. That was the plan. Now, it took a long time before Moses was prepared to do that because he's about to go then go on to a long list of excuses. What's powerful about this passage and why it applies for us for the Lord speaking to us and how it, does, it ties in with prayer. Many of us need to be asking, Lord, is there a bush burning in my life? Lord, what are you trying to tell me? It was in something very ordinary which is a bush but it was also extraordinary because the bush was burning and then a voice was speaking from the bush and it was the Lord and the first thing you had to do was stop walking too close and take off your sandals because you're about to hear from the Lord 
And I think what we see from Moses is when God speaks to us, he first of all lets us know you are in the presence. You need to have a reverent attitude. You're in the presence of the Lord. And not only that, he's going to introduce himself, meaning I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I'm not, I wasn't, it wasn't some past tense. I still am their God. They are in heaven with me right now. I'm talking to Abraham actively. And now, Moses, I'm speaking to you. And now, Broadway Baptist Church, the Lord is speaking to you. This morning I ask you, what is the Lord trying to speak to you through a burning bush? Is the bush burning in your life? I think any time we have a, um, just unusual seasons of change, things where you feel like, God, what's going on? I'm on the far side of a mountain. You always have to be looking. Is a bush burning over here? Because I don't think Moses was expecting to go. Look, he's looking for green grass, and he found a bush on fire. Just the exact opposite of what he was looking for. And we need to be open. You need to be listening. Lord, what are you trying to teach me this morning? Now, we're going to have our invitation. Band, I want to invite you all to come forward. We're going to close this service here with our invitation. Our band's going to lead us in our song. God's placed many things in your life, and you need to respond to the Lord. A bush is burning. The Lord has been speaking to you. Some of you, and many of you, that means to be, you need to make a commitment to God. That commitment might need to be, To one who says, Lord, I need to get saved. This is no accident for me being here. You've brought me here. I'm in your presence. I need to take off my sandals. And I need to realize you are a holy God drawing me to yourself. The Lord speaks to us. A bush burns. He draws us in. We give our lives to Jesus. And we say, Lord, we don't want to respond like Moses is going to respond. We want to say, as Moses first said, here I am. And God looks at Moses and he told him his mission. He says, now go. You do what you know you need to do. We don't want to be believers that live a life of giving excuses to burning bushes. Because one day, those bushes might stop burning in our life. And we're wondering, I never hear from the Lord. It's because you didn't listen to the past seven bushes that God sent on fire to speak to you. And eventually, sin hardens and it puts cold water on these bushes. We're not hearing from the Lord like we used to. If God has a burning bush in your life, as the Lord is speaking to you about getting saved, you need to make sure that you respond to the Lord. You take off your shoes and say, Lord, here I am. Send me. Let's stand together. We're all going to stand. I'm going to stand down front and invite our deacons to come forward here. We respond to Jesus more. You want to make a decision, follow Jesus. You walk down front take my hand. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. And I'm accepting you were condemned. And I'm alive and well, the Spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing
folks we do have Sunday school that starts in a couple minutes here so you want to go to Sunday school class if you do not where, know where to go to your Sunday school class Miss Candy Ramusen runs our welcome center back here you'll go back there and see our welcome center and we will be able to take you to your class direct you to the best class to go to we also have donuts downstairs in the fellowship hall so you can certainly uh, have that as well so uh, we have our 6 a.m. on oh, this coming Wednesday we have our 6 a.m. prayer meeting we have five more uh, so I want to invite you, if you're able to make it, it is finally warmed up on, on Wednesday mornings. Then we have our Wednesday night church. So it's a very active Wednesday here at church. Lots going on, wonderful things going on here at Broadway. And I think Beecher has our closing song. All right, Beecher. Sing that chorus one more time. Two, three, four. Amazing love. 